One Dental Clinic, sponsors of Women Today, offer convenient appointment times in the heart of Douglas so you can fit your dental care into your working day. Talking now about the uh, police youth scheme and Mike Griffiths and Paddy Moore are with us. They are the uh, constables in charge of this. And Mike, just remind us just why this is such an important thing to have over here. I think it, it's it's just a, it's a great scheme for the young people to get involved with. And as I said before, it's us learning from them and them learning from us it's about having that two way street um, and we are in a, a good position where we can offer advice and they can offer us advice as well so yeah So who is eligible to take part in it? Uh, every two years we have a recruitment drive because uh, it is a two year scheme um, and it's from 14 to 17 year olds um, and as I said they're with us for two years and during that time we'll do Duke of Edinburgh Gold Open Water Rescue Certificate First Aid at Work um, but mainly Life Skills um, that we try to impart on them. Now, we met uh, Danny at the start of the show. Um, Mike, we'd like to introduce who else we've got here this afternoon. Yeah, we've also got um, Charlie 2, Bonnie Pepper, Charlie 5, Ellen Lewin, and Charlie 1, Sophie McDonald, and of course, Paddy Moore. Paddy Moore. You need no introduction, do you, really, Paddy? No, like a really famous avocado. Yeah. Um, okay, let's, uh, Bonnie, let's start with you. Why did you want to be uh, part of this scheme? I've always been interested in policing and everything about it. I always. Like watch police documentaries and stuff. I went on to the police work experience, the recent intake, and that gave me like so much more information about policing. And then I was like, I really want to do that. So I applied to be a police cadet, and luckily I got in, and it's been amazing so far. And Ellen, is policing something you're, you've always been interested in? It's more of like a recent thing I've thought about. And how have you found the experience so far then? It's been pretty good. Yeah. And uh, Sophie, when did you decide that you wanted to to be part of the cadets? Well, two years ago, I signed up for the work experience. So me and Danny did it together and it was a really good week and it was just like so informative. So then last June, July, I applied for the cadets and so far it's been really good. I had the very great pleasure of spending some time with a best-selling author who has made the Isle of Man his home. And Alan Bradley is celebrating a really significant achievement, which we're going to hear about more in just a few moments. He was born in Canada and has always had a passion for books, but it was when he was in his early 30s that he began to take the idea of writing more seriously, so he joined writing groups and spent some time with authors. He wrote several short stories before deciding in the mid-1990s to give up the day job, which was, incidentally, Director of Television Engineering at a university in Canada, to focus on writing full-time. And the rest, as they say, is a very successful and award-filled history. So I did catch up with him this morning at his home in Peel, where the magic happens, and first asked if he had a set routine when he was writing. I do. I, I have a library and I write in the library so that I have all of my material within arm's length. I can reach out and uh, grab something from a pile of books. And you've reached a pretty significant landmark, I suppose you could call it, with your series of books. Tell us about that. Well, I've just uh, published the 10th in the series of the Flavia de Luce mystery novels. And uh, we, we've come to something of a landmark because I had contracted for 10 books and uh, amazingly reached 10 books. It took me 10 years, but here we are. And uh, the 10th book was just published uh, recently, and it, it's been doing very, very, very well. So I'm uh, sitting back and just relaxing for a while, taking a breath and enjoying life. I'm sure many people listening will think that 10 books in 10 years is a huge achievement because you hear some authors talk about the years and years it takes just to get one out. That's right. Yeah, I, I don't think if I had known when I started writing the series how many hours it took uh, to write a book. It, it's uh, basically like having a child every year for 10 years because it takes about nine months of writing and three months of polishing to write a book. So having been in that creative state where you're just focused on the book 
and to do that for 10 consecutive books for 10 years is uh, actually quite an accomplishment. I'm starting to be a little bit proud of it. Tell us a, a little bit about Flavia then for people who haven't yet read any of the books. Well, Flavia is, uh, in the first book, is an almost 11-year-old girl who lives in a huge tumble-down mansion somewhere in England. And uh, she has uh, a father who is entirely devoted to collecting postage stamps. And she has two sisters who are devoted to other things than her. So she's left on her own and discovers... uh, in the east wing of this old mansion that there is an abandoned chemistry lab which once belonged to Uncle Tarquin who died back in 1928 and uh, Flavia likes to be alone so she has taken over this wing of the house, poured over Uncle Tarquin's diaries and taught herself an enormous amount about chemistry but her specialty is poisons. Many people, when they write a book, they always put in the front that any likeness to any living person is completely coincidental. But you must always base some characters on someone, mustn't you? I hope not. Some of the characters are not very likeable, and of course some of them are bound to get murdered in a murder mystery. But it has been pointed out to me that Flavia's two obnoxious sisters uh, have a remarkable resemblance to my own two older sisters and uh, some of the dynamics that go on between them uh, ring a lot of bells with readers. I I get a a lot of email from people that say, uh, I know you had two older sisters, my sisters were exactly like that. We are talking now about the push to recruit firefighters at Peel, Castletown and Douglas stations. And if you're thinking this is certainly not for me, I think the next few minutes could possibly change your mind because Nigel Kane and Sarah Quayle are with us. Uh, First of all, Nigel, then give us an overview of who exactly you're looking for. Well, it's one of those jobs where it's full training is given. You don't need any experience. You don't need any prior knowledge. What we're looking for is decent people who are prepared to to give a bit more uh, to the community and they'll get paid for that, too. Um, they'll be trained and um, supported throughout and developed. So ultimately, you've got to be somebody who's willing to learn, willing to take instruction as well, do as they're told, um, have a disciplined approach to, to life in general, um, and, and to be physically fit and strong. Uh, it's not just about running, it's also about lifting heavy things too. Um, so, but background experience really is not essential. No, it's absolutely not essential, no. And sometimes it, it clouds people's behaviours when they come and try uh, some of the tests that we do. It's like they, they'll assume they know something where really they would be better off learning. I've uh, watched a lot of Fireman Sam. Would mm-hmm. that mean I'm a good candidate? Um, it, it's something that it's a good starting point. It's a jumping off point. Um, I would say it's not where you want to finish. Perhaps progress. <laughs> Maybe Trumpton next. Yeah. Do do you, though, without necessarily background knowledge, do you have to be extremely fit? Uh, not extremely fit. It's a moderate level of fitness. Now, there's a bleep test and the science behind that that supports that about um, a, a VO2 max. And I don't pretend to understand that, but it basically equates to uh, 8.8 on a bleep test, which is a 20 metre course. Um, it, it's a measured distance and it, it gives us an indication of people's base level of fitness. Um, and, and there are elements where we test people's physical strength as well, which is about lifting the hose, which when you pick it up, it weighs about 23 kilos. Uh, the further you run with it, is the lighter it gets because it rolls off, of course. But you have to be a strong and fit, but not superhuman fit. We're not talking marathon runners or weightlifters. We should say, actually, that obviously we did uh, do the bleak test last year. Um, and uh, yeah, it's actually manageable it mm-hmm. is manageable we were terrified but it's not as bad as you think it's going to be it's probably only about it's about 10 minutes work yeah mm-hmm. so if you you know it's short and sharp and it gets yeah. tougher but it is probably if you get your head around that it's probably only 10 minutes that you're asked to work for i think that's yeah. achievable isn't it you can uh-huh. push hard knowing that it'll end <laughs> so how long have you been an on-call firefighter sarah three years and what yeah. was it that made you think this is uh, this is what i want to do well i um, received the emails, government emails about all the different jobs and I was just having to look through them and I actually opened this thinking, I think my husband would like that and I started reading through it and I thought oh, 
forget him. I would like that. <laughs> so I just made a few calls. I, I have a cousin who's in the service and I just rang and I said, am I being ridiculous? And I can honestly say everybody I've encountered from that moment till now, no one once said, you know, don't apply. He said, it's not ridiculous at all. As long as you're fit enough, strong enough to do it. Go down to your local station and see what they say. So I did. And in terms of the process, the physical side of it, because I'm guessing the sort of the written application Mm. is fairly straightforward, but in terms of that physical process, how was that? Yeah, I think, like Nigel says, the hose running is probably the the most difficult thing. The beep test you can train for, um, you know, and you you can download it onto the internet and you can literally train for it. You know if you do it or not. But the hose running, there's an element of technique to it. So if you're physically very strong you can just crack on and do it but for me I probably did have to perfect technique a little bit um you know to make up for that deficit of of strength but it's doable the nation station man's radio one of the things I, I didn't uh, like doing was having to go and replace the battery on the radio and going to take a, a wet battery from Circular Road over to Broadway where the guy was selling the batteries, selling it, or, the, or the refurbished batteries, taking them back home. And if you had a bike, it was all right, could you stick it on the bike? But if you didn't have one, you had to, to, to carry it all the way. But it was, uh, it was. You had to have that behalf. Uh, Dick Barton, special agent, at quarter to seven every every night, and that that was enthralling because there was nobody on the street. All the children went inside, and um, the gas lamp on the on the um, on the road um, would be glowing up most most of the time. But when the kids were there, or the children, as I should call them, they they pull the chain on on the. Uh, on the on the gas lamp, and that would turn it on and off. Well, the chap goes around and turned it off at nine o'clock. Of course, they all shinned up the pole and turned it back on again. And uh, it was always a battle to try and get any light in the street because uh, the gas lamp wasn't very strong, and uh, you were susceptible to uh, this chap coming around turning it off, and everybody had to go home or go around the corner until he'd left so they could turn it on again. But it was always a battle. But it was good fun. And um, you formed very close associations with your colleagues in those days, and uh, you went around in packs. I remember Johnny, Johnny, uh, reach your rowing boats were in the, uh, the the place alongside on Circle Road, and he used to pull those rowing boats off there and take them down onto the harbour, to, and to be towed around the promenade, and uh, and it was it was difficult to get them down. The, those hills, they went down at a rate of knots and the, all the kids were clinging to these rowing boats every year and then at the end of the summer they'd have to go back up onto the yard but that was always good fun. You made um, a wonderful picture it, there, George. It, it was good. It was good fun at the time, I must admit. I'm glad you mentioned uh, bikes because we've got a little bit of a story about a bike and you which I'm sure we'll come to a little bit later but uh, let's take a break for your first piece of music. Yeah. This is from the Righteous Brothers. What have you chosen? Unchained Melody, um, that harks back to uh, just after my childhood times and um, it was a tune that was going round and round and round and round. You just couldn't get it out of your head at the time and that was a a difficult time to, uh, you know, get away from it because it was everywhere you went, they had this Unchained Melody on. You can still hear it now quite often. Station. 
With us now is Dot Tilbury. And Dot, I was talking a little bit about the history of this event and the fact that some of the people that we've got here today are very much connected with the start of Braid Hall. And uh, you are no exception. Well, I'm no exception because my father, Percy Kelly, was a founder member. And he was a member of the football team, believe it or not. They had a, a ladies' team and a men's team. And my father, I think he was one of the good fellas. You know, he could have been in Everton or somewhere. <laughs> but um, the Braid Hall, this Braid Hall was built in 1937. And it was known as the Braid Young Men's Club. And women were admitted by invitation only. Can you imagine? They were all right to do the dishes. That's what they said. What made you special enough as a woman to get an invite then? Well, yeah, to do the dishes. That was it. You just had to be really good yes. at cleaning. No other reason. Set the table and do the dishes. Good with the fairy and a sponge. And the thing is, actually, that didn't change until fairly recently. Well, it certainly wasn't changed on the books until fairly recently. 1990. <laughs> Never. We're at altitude up here, you see, and I, I, we haven't heard of Brexit up here, thank God. <laughs> But anyway, um, I've just got a few little notes. They had a football team. They played billiards and darts. And um, we think December the 7th, 1937, was the first to Stedford. And um, so there was a bus that came out from Douglas that cost the committee a pound to bring people out from Douglas. And then they had bachelor's tea parties and concerts. And the men waited on. Um, which was very on PC for those days, wasn't it? The men waiting on. And my Nana Kelly, who lived down the road in Balacunya Cottages, she used to bring all her cups and saucers up in a big galvanised uh, can thing and because they had no cups and saucers, so everybody brought their cups and saucers from home to, to you know, for the social nights. So it was great, and then... 30 years ago, um, the Bray was in a bit of a mess and um, the committee decided then that they would re-sort of build it. The roof was leaking, the floor was bad and the Manx Lottery helped out. So it saved the Braid Hall, the Manx Lottery, so we're very grateful to the lottery funding. And then, of course, once a year we have all sorts. We have um, the Estedford, which is sort of the highlight and we've got some of the stars of the Estedford here today. <laughs> and um, we've got bingo, which we have at Christmas and Easter. And we've got the conquer competition, which you're not allowed to hold anywhere else in the world. So ours is the world championship. Hop tune um, We have, you know, the halls open to rent for night rallies, birthday parties, liquidator meetings, believe it or not. There's a few of those about. Art lessons, craft meetings. And of course, um, we have the cycling up here, the indoor turbo session of cycling um, every Thursday night from Christmas through to Mar November through to March. So it's a busy little place.